Thanks. Well, good morning, everyone. Turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. And we'll be reading uh, verses 1 through 21. Exodus 20, verses 1 through 21. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled. And they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Well, Father, pray that your word would ring out uh, in power today, that we would uh, hear uh, what for many of us are very familiar words, uh, but uh, that we would understand them a little bit more deeply and be able to treasure them uh, more uh, as a result of what you have to say to us today. Be with us, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, a uh, couple things I want to say today uh, before we get into uh, the text or the passage itself. There are some, uh, well, if you're over the age of 30 in here, uh, you probably grew up at a time where one of the, the big arguments was, are there what we call moral absolutes? Are there, is there, uh, are there things which are always wrong? To do, and are there things which are always right? And uh, one of the, the the big conflict was is morality, is ethics. Are they relative or are they absolute? Are there some things that are true for all people in all places, in all contexts? Um, our society has pretty much settled that question. Uh, we have uh, come to the conclusion that there are indeed moral absolutes. There are things that are true at all times for all people. It's just that we have shifted uh, those absolutes. Uh, for those of us, uh, again, over the age of 30, uh, the question that, that are there moral absolutes was framed in terms of is God's law binding? Is there, is there a God? Does he have a law? And do we have to respond to it? But no culture can survive without a set of absolute moral standards. And our culture, as it rejected God, and as it moved away from uh, the biblical foundation of our ethics that had lasted for almost 2,000 years in Western civilization, uh, now what's been embraced is, yeah, there are moral absolutes, but those are centered on issues of uh, what 
what many would call social justice, and particularly uh, how we uh, identify ourselves uh, in terms of race, in terms of gender, in terms of sexuality. That's where the new moral absolutes have, have, have migrated to. That is what is being embraced by uh, our elite culture and is being taught uh, in, our, in our schools to people under, uh, to, to our, in our elementary and public uh, high schools. And those ideas, uh, some of them do track with what the scripture says, a lot of them do not. A lot of them, particularly in areas of gender and sexuality, are in direct conflict with what God says. Now, I'm not here to argue uh, about, about that in particular. I just want us to begin to take a look at, there's a deeper question we have to ask. And that is, where do moral standards come from? Why should we obey them? And what do those standards reflect about reality, and particularly about God. And so when we look at the Ten Commandments today, uh, I'm not going to uh, go through all of the particular commandments. Uh, that would take a sermon series in itself to do. But I want to look at why God gives us these commands. What, is, what are the Ten Commandments? What is the entire law of Moses? And what does that reveal about God? And what does that reveal about us? And my hope is that in that, it'll turn our thoughts and our hearts away from, you know, how do I do this? I don't want to do this. Can I, can I accept this? It'll turn our thoughts and energy away from ourselves and onto the God who speaks. Because I believe that we can only embrace God's law when we embrace God himself and see him as good and beautiful and turn to worship him. So with that in mind, I want to begin uh, by talking about the law of Moses and the Ten Commandments and some misconceptions uh, about it. What, what, are, what is the Mosaic Law and the Ten Commandments and what are they not? I think that's the first slide that we would have up here. Uh, what the Mosaic Law, what is it, what it is, and what it is not? Okay? And the first thing I want to say is it is not a roadmap to salvation. It was never meant for that. Okay? The, I, I hear this teaching sometimes that the Ten Commandments was given to Israel along with the Mosaic Law, and if the people could uh, hold the law and do it, then they would be saved. Okay? That's not exactly what this law is about. Uh, this law is a national law for the nation of Israel. Okay? For the nation of Israel. The Mosaic Law was a national law. It was not a blueprint for the United States government or any other nation. Uh, again, you'll hear this teaching sometimes, the United States should adopt the Mosaic law in its entirety, all 600 and whatever commandments. Uh, things like don't sow two kinds of seed in a field or don't wear two kinds of uh, clothing mixed together. Don't wear polyester and acrylic or, or whatever. Okay. No more shrimp, no more pork. That was not what the law was for. The law was for the people of Israel. So the third, it is a national law uh, to, to govern the nation of Israel before the coming of Christ. So the Ten Commandments, which I'll get into, uh, are the basic foundation for the Mosaic Law. But the Mosaic Law is much more than that. The Mosaic Law, uh, again, as I said, has over 600 various commands that govern everything from how sacrifices are to be offered to what kind of clothes you are to wear to what you're to do after you have a child to uh, all sorts of other things. So that was for Israel. It was not for uh, all of the nations. And that's made very clear throughout the Bible. This law is for Israel. If Israel as a nation kept the law by enforcing its provisions, then they would have been able to stay in their land forever. Uh, they failed in that, and they were forced out of the land. But it was never seen as the individual's guide to being saved. Now again, as I said, the Ten Commandments are a little bit different. They represent the moral foundation of the rest of the Mosaic Law. Uh, 
They represent God's holy nature and his righteousness. All of the other commands are how to apply the Ten Commandments in one particular context, in the setting of uh, a rural, agrarian nation uh, 1,000 years before Jesus came. How we apply the Ten Commandments uh, in our church today uh, is a little bit different, and the New Testament has a lot to say about that. So that's the first thing I want to do, is just talk about some misconceptions. It's never, it was never meant as the individual's roadmap to salvation. Now, if we go to the next slide, I want to talk about what the law is, the heart of the law. And the first thing I want to say is the heart of the law is about grace. Mm -hmm. Now, some of you may not know exactly what I mean. What is grace? Okay. Grace is when you are given something that you do not deserve. Or when uh, you don't get what you should get. You don't get the punishment that you deserve. You either get a gift, a good thing that you don't deserve, or you, get a, you don't get a punishment that you do deserve. So uh, an example of that would be if you know, our daughter, uh, she completes her homework and does her chores, and we give her her weekly allowance. That is not grace. Okay? That is, she has earned that. She has done what she needs. She's met the conditions necessary that we have laid out for her to receive her allowance, okay? If she doesn't do her homework or uh, skips some of her chores and then we give her her allowance, okay? that is grace. It may also be bad parenting, but it is grace, okay? She, we've given her something that she did not deserve, okay? Or, or if, likewise, she... Uh, she goes over her media limits, okay, and we punish her. That's not, that's justice. If uh, we refrain from punishing, we say we're going to let you, we're going to give you uh, grace this time and not punish you, okay? She's not gotten the punishment that she deserves, okay? Gr the law is based on grace, and grace always comes before law. Look at Exodus 19, verses 4 through 6. Exodus 19 verses 4 through 6, which Pastor David read uh, to us last week, where it says that you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and have brought you to myself. Now, therefore, okay, the therefore, what fall? Because of you seeing what I've done, the grace that I showed you in rescuing you from Egypt, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant. Or here in the Ten Commandments themselves. Verse 2 starts with, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. God's grace in rescuing them from Egypt is the ground, the basis for which his law is given. We are to obey because we have been rescued. We do not obey in order to be rescued. God has called you to himself. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, God has made the gospel known to you that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. You put your hope and trust in him. You now belong to him. You have the Holy Spirit. And now you are called into a relationship with him that is marked by our obedience. But the grace comes first. We don't earn anything from God by our works. Our works are an expression of gratitude for and trust in God's grace to us. Next, the second thing, the second uh, thing I want to talk about, the heart of the law too, is worship is the foundation of the law. Foundation may not, yeah, yeah it's, it's, the, it's the beginning step of obedience. This law, the Ten Commandments, is fundamentally about God. If you look at the first four commandments, the commandment two, have no other gods before him, to have no idols in our worship, 
that we are not to take the Lord's name in vain. We're not to uh, use his name as if it is cheap. So when you say OMG, okay, and when you're shocked at something, right, that technically is a violation of the Ten Commandments because you're not actually, you're not actually saying anything to God. You're using God's word as just some cheap expression. Okay. Or the fourth, the Sabbath. These are all primarily about worshiping God. The law of God is about worshiping him, about recognizing who he is, how good he is, what he has done for us, what he promises to do for all who trust in him. Honoring him as he is called to be honored. This is why we begin our worship services with praise. This is why we even have worship services. Our Christian life, the first day of the week, is marked by us coming together as the body of Christ to worship God, out of which should flow our obedience for the rest of the week. If you look down... Uh, in the section Andy will, Minister Andy will take us through next week, it starts, verses 22 through 26 of Exodus 20, are also the particular laws given to Israel are about worship. These two things cannot be underestimated, that the law is fundamentally flowing out of grace and leading us into worship. All of our practical love of neighbor, our care for each other, our working diligently at work or in school, all of these flow out of our worship of God. And that any obedience that doesn't come from a heart that worships God is obedience that does not please him. So then, yeah, Pastor Andrew, what is worship? Well, we will have a whole section on worship in Exodus when we get to chapter 25. I'll just say today that worship is the showing our, how much God is worth to us. It's the expression of what God means to us. So when you come and you sing the songs that we sing today, when you sit in rapt attention at the hearing of the word of God, those are acts of worship because you are expressing, whether in your body posture right now, in your, the posture of your heart right now, or the, the, the voice you were lifting up earlier today, you're expressing what God means to you. That is what worship is. That is why we see giving as an act of worship. Right now, we, we don't take offerings uh, at church expect, except on special occasions. Most of us, uh, our, our giving is done by our phone or our computer. I love the convenience of that. I think that is probably the best way for us to do this. But I do miss the old, the old days uh, at previous churches where ushers would come down with offering bags and you would put your money in the bag or in the offering plate as a concrete act of worship to God in the, in the service. And so the next time you... I don't know, sign up for automatic online giving. Okay, uh, Do so in a spirit of prayer and praise to God in worship of him. Okay, so I want to move us now. Uh, that's the heart of the law. Grace moving us into worship. I want to talk about, the, the, you've got the Mosaic law and then you've got uh, the Ten Commandments that found, that found it. How are we to think of it today as Christians? This was a law given to Israel 3,400 years ago in 21st century United States of America at West Houston Chinese Church. What is the purpose of the law? If we can go to the next slide. There are three uses of the law. Okay? The first use is the law is our teacher. It teaches us about God ourselves, and our need for a savior. Okay? The law demonstrates God's righteousness. 
The Ten Commandments show us what God, what pleases God, what kind of God we have, what is right in his eyes, and what is wrong in his eyes. It puts forward a standard that none of us can meet. But it does, it shows our God as being a good God, a righteous God, a God who judges righteously. The second thing that the law teaches is that it teaches our inability to attain God's righteousness. Jesus talks about this in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. In, in, in that chapter, uh, he looks at how people were interpreting the law of Moses. It says, you know, do not, uh, you, you shall love your neighbor. That's Leviticus 19.8. Love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. And Jesus says, no, you are to love your enemy as yourself. Or it talks about uh, lust. Okay? The Ten Commandments says, do not commit adultery. And Jesus says, let's look at what that really means. Not committing adultery means not looking at somebody else with lustful intent. How many of you have never done that? The Ten Commandments says, do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Well, technically, you could say that that just means that uh, in a court of law, you are not to testify against your neighbor. I mean, that's technically what the words mean. And Jesus says, no. Underneath that is a God who delights in the truth. And that your yes is always to be yes. Your no is always to be no. You are to say what you mean and mean what you say. Always. How many of you have kept that perfectly? None of us has. The law reveals our inability to attain God's righteousness. And then the law shows us that despite our inability to keep it perfectly, we still have hope. In the law itself, there is a system of sacrifice where uh, for your sins, offerings were put forward, animals were killed in your place. We know that no animal can take your sin away. But this pointed forward to the once for all sacrifice in Jesus Christ. And so if you were uh, an Israelite in 1000 BC and the priest sacrificed a lamb for your sins, God would look at that and on the basis of Jesus' death a thousand years later would forgive you through the sacrifice of the lamb. The sacrificial system teaches that our inability to keep God's commandments does not leave us hopeless that God can send us a savior. So the law is our teacher. That's the first use of the law. It is to lead us to Jesus Christ. The second use of the law, it's a restraint on evil. It restrains uh, the sinful heart. So if you look at, say, uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 5, they're asking Jesus about divorce. In the Mosaic law, it says, Moses wrote he gives a process for divorce. If you're going to divorce your wife, you have to write her a certificate of divorce. So everyone knows that she is divorced uh, and that she is free to remarry. Jesus said, for your hardness of heart, this commandment was given. Moses wrote you this commandment. But God's original plan for marriage is one man, one woman, forever, as one flesh. The law restrains human evil. If we were sinless, we would have no need to care for the poor because there would be no poor. But because we are sinful, we will live in societies in which there are always poor people. Therefore, there are commandments given on how we are to care for the poor. 1 Timothy 1, 9-11 says, The law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient for the ungodly and sinners. This is why God gave the law, or the second reason. 
the law and all, not just the Mosaic law, all human law is designed to restrain evil. I mean, can you imagine the chaos we would have on our streets, on our roads, if we did not have traffic laws? You know, I can tell you that most red lights would be there for reference only if, if, when I, was, if I were driving and we had no traffic laws. If I could do that with impunity, I probably would. Okay. I'm sure many of if you're an adult in here, there are many things you've probably done or not done, you've restrained from doing simply because they're illegal. Children or youth. I know that there are, I mean, just from my own experience, there are things where, there are things I wanted to do, and if I did them, I knew I would get in trouble with uh, the school, and so I just didn't do them. The fear of punishment restrains the evil in our hearts. Okay? That's the second purpose of the law. The third is that the law, the third use of the law is it is a guide to Christian living. The law should, how do you live as a redeemed, saved child of God? Well, the law gives us our instructions. Romans 8, God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Okay? Very simply, what that means is, God gave us the law that told us what we should do, but we couldn't do it. Jesus sends us the spirit which regenerates our heart so that we now have the power to do what God requires. Now that we have been saved, the law is no longer there to restrain us. We want to do the law. We want to please God. We want to obey him. Before I came to know Jesus, what restrained me from looking at pornography, because back in the day, you want to look at pornography, you had, to, you had to do it publicly. You had to go to the store and buy a magazine, or you had to go to the, uh, the video store and buy a video. And my fear is that if I ever did that, the next time I come with a friend, the person at the desk would say, hey, I remember, you're the one who rented that, uh, and, you know, remind them of the video that I rented before. And just like... That would be mortifying. Shame kept me from that. As a believer in Jesus Christ, it's no longer fear of being found out, but a desire to please God that causes me to say no. Summarized in the great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Paul says that the law of Christ, loving your neighbor, fulfills the law of Christ. And when we have been saved, when we have been redeemed, we've come to know Jesus, the law is no longer there to restrain us from evil. The law is there to help us walk in a pathway that brings life and blessing to us. When we see, there are two points of application here. When we see that the law is based on grace and we've come to experience grace and we've come to know who God is, okay, something changes in our heart. Remember, before I became a Christian, the idea of giving of, of giving a portion of your income to the church or of just even being generous to others it just seemed very strange and foreign to me. I had no desire to do that. I just wondered, why would, why would you part with your hard-earned money to, to give to an organization? It, it just, it, it made no sense to me. As I experienced the grace of Jesus Christ, Something changed in my heart. I wanted to be generous. 
I wanted to give, not just uh, to, to the church and to, uh, to kingdom organizations, but just to be generous with my resources, to treat people to meals, to give to the poor, to give to homeless people. I'm not saying anything about the wisdom of that. I'm just saying there was a desire to uh, give, to, to help homeless people share a meal. Because as I had received grace, I wanted to live a life that demonstrated that grace. And I began to see that the law of God really is a law that empowers us to live a life of grace, of showing grace to other people. Grace produces obedience in a way that nothing else can because grace touches our heart and changes who we are at the deepest part of our being. And that is why a life pleasing to God and service to our neighbor must be connected to worship. If we are not rightly worshiping God, we cannot truly love our neighbor as ourselves. Because all of the law is an outflowing of worship towards God, of expressing our thanks and our love for God's grace. And that is why worship is so critical to our lives as believers. If we want to love our neighbor during the week, then we need to worship God with all our heart and soul here on Sundays. Not just here on Sundays, but as the, the starting point for our life of worship. You know, we have, uh, we've tried, we've been thinking through and are still thinking through how we can do that better here uh, at, uh, in the English congregation at WHCC. That's one of the reasons we have uh, included children, originally included youth, now have included children in our worship. We want uh, our, we want people, we want people to see their parents worshiping God rightly. We want them to see young adults whom youth and children often look up to worshiping God rightly. So one of the things that I would just call on all of us to do is remember, as you're here on Sundays, remember that we ourselves are looking to God during the worship, but we're also leading other people into the worship of God. So if you're here with your children or your uh, you're here with your youth. I'm making that distinction for purposes here. Remember that the kind of worshipers they'll grow up into is the kind of worshiper they see here at church. You know, if they see you kind of zoning out and looking at your phone during the sermon or kind of not really paying attention to the singing or just kind of barely even mouthing the lyrics, what's communicated is the sermon's not very important, Singing to God is not very important. My hope is that an intergenerational service will spur all of us, regardless of our age, into a deeper commitment to worshiping God and in doing so, experience Him more deeply, experiencing His grace more deeply in order that we might be empowered to live out a life pleasing to God when we, live, when we leave here. I trust that God will do this for us. So let's pray. Father God, your law reveals you to be a God of grace and love, who loves justice, who cares about families and about rest, and I just pray about, about our interactions with each other. And I pray that we would catch your heart in your law. That we would grasp the depth of your grace. And in doing so, we would want to worship you. And we would want to live a life pleasing to you. I pray, Father, that it's the third use of the law as a guide to a life pleasing to you that would motivate us not the second use as a, a whip to keep us in line. That you would take our hearts 
and focus them on you so that your law becomes a delight to our hearts and a path for life and joy. And I pray that would start here, that on Sunday mornings we would worship you passionately in the ways that you have prescribed for us as one body across the generations. And then in doing so, we would see you more and more deeply and love you with greater and greater passion. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.